Dragon Slayer Media presents Rich Gaspari and John Romano in Fitness, Fame, and Fortune. So, Richie, I was going over the metrics of our show, and I was surprised to see that the show that we did um, with Stacy Kaufman on, from the guy who invented ProTan, I was really surprised to see what a low um, viewership that show had when, I mean, ProTan is, it, it's one of the staples of the industry. I mean, I, it, tanning is so important to, to bodybuilding. And I was just curious as to get, you know, what you thought about that as to why we didn't get a, a, as much of a interest in the actual bedrock tanning product of the industry. I mean, Stacy's been, you know, a staple of the sub of the bodybuilding industry for the last 30 years, 30, 40 years. He's very well known, you know, in the circles. Right. You know, I guess our audience don't know who Stacy Kaufman is. Um, he's done a lot. Like you said, he's been able to take uh, a category, you know, where guys were trying to figure out how to tan. And like myself, you know, in the beginning, we were using that stuff called Diaderm that made you look right. green. And, you know, people didn't understand you're supposed to remove the application <laughs> once <laughs> once you get tan, you know, because people don't understand how to take it because it was used for vitiligo. Um, and then he just copied the formula of, di of the Diaderm and made his own, but he made it better. And up to today, you know, he goes to all these major shows like – you're at the Olympia, the Arnold, the Nationals, even globally, he travels the world tanning all the pros. Every one of these pros at these shows are tanned by, you know, pro tan. But by, by hand, too, not by, to by, Well, they use it with a spray and, you know, it's almost like when you go in a car, people are in a booth and they're. You're spraying these yeah, people. Yeah, no, no. He he said he said in the interview that the, the Olympians get like a hand application. I guess they get it. I get it even more specialized yeah. to do it by hand because it's right. Olympia competitors. But it's you know he knows his shit when it comes to you know the tanning. You know this show is fitness, fame, and fortune. You know we we continue to evolve in this show. This show was you know was going to be set for people in the fitness industry that were entrepreneurs. Obviously we've. We're, we're doing that, but then we're going beyond that and still talking, you know, to bodybuilders and whatever, you know, our audience is interested in, we'll talk about, you know, and that's what we're doing. And you made some comments that the best shows or the highest viewership are the shows that you and I do together. Yeah, we actually hold the record now. We passed Palumbo. So, wow! <laughs> yeah, you and I are, are you and I are have been our best show. But uh, but, but I, don't, I don't want to pat ourselves on the back. I, I want to. Why I, not? I Let's pat ourselves on the back. Why <laughs> other people do that? But no, I, I think this tanning topic is real. I'm like shocked. I mean, what did you guys? You, you were not part of that whole tan. You were using like diet before that. You were using what iodine and and. And Clorox, uh, I mean, shit. I mean, what were you guys my doing? My first show as a teenager, I was trying to figure out what to do, and someone said to you know to add iodine in baby oil, and you know I figured let me get ready for a show in the spring because it was fairly warm. So you know in warm days in April, I was sitting there tanning, even though it was like fifty degrees. I'd be you know trying to tan. <laughs> I was living in New Jersey, so I was trying to like get a tan. You know, in the cold. So let me go. Let me get ready for shows in like June. So at least I have May. You right. know, to, <laughs> I try to tan as natural as possible. You know, then when I turned pro, you know, they started having tanning boots. You know, that was that was a big craze. You know, all the tanning boots that we were using to get tan. Um, but Stacy came about in the um, in the eighties when I was competing. You know, as a as you know, in the mid to late eighties. That's when he came about. And then I was using his product. I started using his product and never left his product and, until I stopped competing. Um, and, he, you know, everything he used was, you know, the oil is very important because, you know, people don't understand if you use mineral oil, it kind of just sits on your skin. You want to use a, a natural vegetable oil that it soaks in, you know, and it gives you a better sheen, you know, in color. Not color, but better sheen and shine when you're mm -hmm. on stage, you know, which is important. People are, people don't understand that don't compete. Like, why do they sit there and uh, get tan? You know, what do they? Why do they need to tan when you have bright lights on your skin? 
it washes away your cuts. Why do you use oil? You know, people think it's like weird. Why, you know, why do bodybuilders slather oil all over their bodies? And it's to accentuate the definition in cuts. If you, if you didn't put any oil on, you would just look flat on stage. So all these things, you know, Stacy took into account, you know, the type of oil, the type of, you know, tanning products, you know, he would add another, you know, another, besides just like the Diaderm product called Protan, you had another topical cream that you would apply as well to your skin and then the oil product. And then there was a product that he had, like, you know, we were talking about it before I was his first subject or his first athlete that when you rub it on, it kind of has, it had a, like a burning, like a, a, a feeling like your skin was like hot. So it made all the veins come out. That was another product that he made. Very interesting. So where did, where did that whole tanning idea come from? Was that like from the photographers? Were they the ones saying that oh, the, photo the photos, the bodies would look way better if we, you know, made them darker and created more highlights? Or was it, is it something Joe Weider came up with? Where, where did that whole, you know, genesis of, of the tanning come from? I, I, well, that was before my time to really say. <laughs> I mean, I know I know Arnold was tanning, you know, and he would be in Southern California, you know, tanning yeah, but, naturally. But they would just lay out at the beach. That, yeah. that, where did this whole artificial intensification of the tan? I, I think when they started to have more shows and, you know, bodybuilding became bigger in other states. Like, you know, if you have a show in Michigan, you're not seeing the sun till like mid-June. You know, so what are you going to do? You yeah. know, so you got to figure out using some type of topical cream to get yourself to be tan. Um, I, I mean, I just, I think it just evolved with the time of, you know, when we first started doing shows, I, I guess, John, you competed from the 80s. The shows were, you know, very sparse. They were shows that were ran in like a, a gymnasium, you know, a, a high school gymnasium right. was, that's where my with a spotlight was. on you. <laughs> and, you know, before that, it was like funny because they would run bodybuilding at the end because they'd have like a weightlifting event. And then bodybuilding would be the end, you know, after the weightlifting when most people left, you know. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember Joe telling me that one of the first stories he told me was about how, you know, the, the, that the bodybuilding shows were at held at weightlifting events and that they would actually, just like you said, they would have all the weightlifting competition first. And then they put these tables together and they, these guys would stand on the tables, right? And start posing. And, and start posing. And it's funny because when I first started watching shows as a, shoot, I was a teenager, they were AAU events. The, the NPC didn't exist yet. Right. So there were AAU events and there was weightlifting or powerlifting before the bodybuilding show. And I'd have to wait for this powerlifting that I didn't really have an interest in to watch, you know, wait for the bodybuilding to happen. So I, I did witness that, you know, and how it evolved so, so much. And, you know, you know, I have to thank Joe Weider, you know, and Jim Mannion who started, you know, the NPC, which was, I think it was, I think the first NPC event was 1982 when, um, when Lee Haney won the first, you know, Lee Haney won the first NPC Nationals. I did not know that. In 1982. The first one, really? Wow. Yeah, he won the first NPC Nationals in 19, it started in 1982 was the year. Oh, so, so now, well, wait, so, so the IFBB came first. That was. Uh, the IFBB came first and, and that was developed by Joe Weider. Well, it was Ben, really, right? Ben and Joe, yeah, Joe, yeah. Uh, Ben Weider. And and that was like, they, they did have amateur IFBB events. And then I think, I, I'm not sure how Jim came about, but I think sometime in the you know beginning of the 80s, I think Jim said, let me start this, you know, USA Federation called the National Physique Committee. And he started it, you know, I think in 1981 when he started it. Because I remember it was it was started very early. I was I was still in in, in the high school, and um, and I and I think he he made a deal with Joe to supply the amateur athletes to go into the IPB because back then in the seventies you also had NABA and WABA right, and all right. these other organizations you had and IPB in the, in that time was still very weak. You know, winning the Mr. Olympia, 
you know, for like someone like Larry Scott, wasn't that big of an I, you know, it wasn't that big of a show, right? You know, it was tiny. I, th- I think Arnold said his biggest prize money was five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, five hundred or a thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for, you know, <laughs> so it was really not a, it wasn't a big deal. And when Arnold first started winning that show, which was nineteen seventy, which wow, it's nineteen seventy. He right. won that show, and and a couple of the years, he had no competitors against him. He just got crowned Mister Olympia. <laughs> so he won seven Olympias, but I think a couple of them were, or one or two, was not really like competition no for him. I think his wow. biggest competitions were like Sergio Oliva, when you know Sergio made his comeback. I think in seventy one in Essen, Germany, mm-hmm. after he lost to Arnold in seventy, I think he came back to really want to beat him and. They said he should have beaten Arnold in that show. And, you know, and I saw some pictures. He, he was, you know, Sergio was way ahead of his time. He was a, he was right. a freak with that little, little waist. Mm-hmm. And, you know, his arms were bigger than his, you know, his head. <laughs> you know, that, that's one of the guys that I looked at and I said, this guy is not real. You know, I don't know about yeah, yeah. you. Did, did you ever meet him? Oh, yeah, I did. Well, I met him and I competed against him in the in 85 Olympia. That's that was right. my first That's Olympia. Right. That's right. Your first Olympia. And I and I beat him. I mean, he was my childhood hero. You know, he came in seventh and I came in third. And, you know, for me, he was he was not even real because there's a picture I remember in my gym that I trained. He was doing a most muscular and he was just so massive in his most muscular. And I go, this can't be real. It's got to be just a drawing. But it really was him that, and how big he uh, was. Well, know. that was that was the, my first impression of bodybuilding was him. My my father was watching ABC Wild World of Sports in like seventy one, um, seventy or seventy one. I think it was nineteen seventy, and and uh, or or seventy two. I was twelve years old. And one of those early seventies ones, and he called me in. He goes, John, you got to see this. And we had the black and white TV in the family room. And as soon as I turned the corner. Saw the TV, Sergio was hitting a crab shot. And and all I could remember were those traps just going up, like, you know, yeah, almost yeah. closing his ears off, you know? And, and that was it. I wanted to be a bodybuilder after that. It, yeah. was, it was just so incredible. But what was that like? Beating, not just competing against your child, your hero, but beating them. Like, well, like the first shot out, that, that had to be. You got to remember, I, I, you know, I, I, I was like a guy who was winning all the shows in Jersey, I moved to California because I was told that, you know, I was a big fish in a little pond. And if I really wanted to do something, I needed to, you know, beat the big fish in, in, in Venice. You know, So I moved there, you know, and I was, you know, I was there, I t- you know, I, I, we've told the stories. I was 19 years old and I moved to California and all I did was challenge people there, you know, and training and lifting. And, you know, I read every magazine, you know, when I saw whatever Tom Platts did. I, I I replicated his weight, his reps, whatever he could do, and I made sure I could do it. And then when I went there, they're going, he doesn't really do that. <laughs> you know, some of the stuff he does. Well, that yeah, but that was that was uh, subscribing to some crazy shit. I mean, he was the guy who was doing hundred rep sets with like squats with three fifteen or something. Yeah, like that. he would do like crazy stuff. I would try so much stuff like that. You know, I, my best squat was seven thirty five. You know, and I and I remember doing that in my gym in New Jersey, and I would get pissed because the bar would bend and then it stayed bent. And my the gym owner was like pissed at me. I said, "What do you got these shitty bars for? I can't squat. <laughs> <laughs> can't squat there. You break the equipment." That, that tells a story. I was I was in Miami, and we went to do a photo shoot. You know, for Gaspar Nutrition, we were we were at the Muscle Beach, Miami, and this guy comes running to me. Oh my God, Rich! And he was the kid that basically trained when I was there as a teenager in New Jersey in this gym. And he started saying, you know what this guy did? And he started to tell all the stories, you know, about. Wait, so he, he was an older guy that used to train at your gym when you were a kid. Yeah, he was, then- he was, he was a couple years. He was one year younger than me when I was a teenager training in the gym in Milltown, New Jersey. Right. It was called, it was a must, it was actually a gold's gym. The first gold's gym. He was the first gold's gym in New Jersey. Wow. And, uh, I trained in that gym and this kid trained there and he goes, he goes, this guy is the guy who taught me about intensity. This is the guy when I was training 
he would be like, you're not training, you're a pussy. <laughs> <He's healthy. laughs> but he was just, he was like, and he goes, but Rich really helped me because Rich really showed me what it was to really chain to the next level. He goes, I seen that, and, he, and this is where I was saying about 735. He goes, I've seen that guy go all the way down on a 735 squat. I've seen him do, you know, I seen him do, I seen him do five and a half plates for like 30 reps all the way down. Then I was like, holy shit, I don't remember that. He goes, he goes, the lifts he was doing is incredible. He was telling the stories how he was like throwing people off benches to, you know, get to, the, to do my workout. And uh, that almost got you killed. But, but, then, but you went back to the question about beating Sergio. Oliva, yeah, yeah. Who's my boyhood hero. hero. I was, you know, I think about it now and I'm like, holy shit, I beat like my boyhood hero. But then I was so in it. I was so like focused to be a winner. I was focused to beat anybody in my way. So for me, he was in my way. <laughs> I wanted to beat him. <laughs> and that's, it's sad to say, because I, I think he's one of the greatest bodybuilders who ever lived. And, but at that time, you know, he was not at his best. Obviously he was older. I think he was in his forties. He was in his mid forties or early forties, yeah, yeah. early forties, early forties. And, um, you know, I was 20 years old, 21. I just turned 21, got in the Olympics, <laughs> coming in third place. And, you know, standing next to Sergio and like, I'm going to beat him. And, you know, it's it, it was a great feeling. When I when I went into that Olympia, it, it was surreal because all the heroes that I, you know, was reading magazines about, I was there standing on stage with them. And these some of these guys, I would look at them like, you know, Tony Pearson, you know, who was Mr. America and, you know, he was in the Olympia. I, I got to beat him. Tom Platts, I got to go against him. Um, Samir Banu. I, actually, I didn't go against Samir Banu. Samir Banu was not in the 85. He got out of the – we talked – we had him on our yeah, interview. Yeah, we had, Samir right. Banu got out of the IPB for a couple of years and came back in 1988. Mm -hmm. And that's where I got to compete against him. Right. He went NAVA. But um, – I think of my mindset and that guy like brought it back, you know, telling me, he goes, this guy had the mindset of a champion. Nothing would get in his way. And I have the deepest respect. He goes, I have the deep, you know, people didn't, you know, thought they didn't like him, but I've never seen a guy more focused than this guy. You know, he was telling, he was telling my, the, the guy, who, you know, Jason who works for me, does um, the videography and he was telling Alex Gonzalez, he goes, it was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. And I was like, wow, he's, you know, I thought about it. I was like many moons ago how I thought, you know, as this, you know, 20 year old kid with this, you know, a 19 year old kid with this mission to be the best and nothing stood in my way. And, you know, whether they said I didn't have the right genetics, I, you know, I still went the full course to, to beat a lot of greats, you know, like a Sergio Oliva. You, you picked off guys, like you just said, Tom Platts, Robbie Robinson, you beat Robbie Robinson. Many I've never had Robbie beat me, so I beat Robbie Robinson many times. The other guy who was like favored to be the next Lee Haney was um no, I can't remember. Bob Paris. Bob was Paris. one of them. Serge um, was great. Did you did you Mike Mike um Mike Christian? Mike, Mike Christian, yeah, that's what I was thinking. I did. Mike Christian, I thought it was a great bodybuilder. No one could do a three quarter back. I mean, he did a three quarter back as good as Arnold. Yeah. Great back, great arms. He had some great, you know, body parts. I mean, he was weak in the legs that I think hurt him. Yeah. But um, he was still a great bodybuilder. And, you know, it was – I never let him beat me after that. <laughs> but, but, but so what, your your mindset – I mean, I knew you I, – I met. that's when I met you back then. I mean, and you, you, you were – there's definitely a – when a difference in your demeanor when you walk into a room with another person you, you immediately look at Richie you don't look at the other guy and so there's something there's definitely something about you that like comes out that that is part of that whole thing do you are you aware of that or is that something that's just gifted to you or do you manufacture it or or are you oblivious to it I, I mean I, I you know, now that I'm older, I, I I've been a, I've been aware of that mindset that I had that was so driven and focused, laser focused to be, you know, the best. Um, I've been through times in my life that I've been really down. You know, the audience should know I went through a lot of like ups and downs. 
And, you know, I've always been that type of person to come back up. But when I'm on track, nothing, I, you know, I feel unstoppable that nothing's going to get in my way. You know, people would say, well, you don't have the genetics to be a champion. You don't have this to have it. I said, fuck you guys. I'm going to be the best, <laughs> you know, that I could be. And what am I going to do? Because I think I can work harder than anybody else. So a guy who's better is not going to be more ripped than me. A guy who's better is not going to pose better than me. A guy who's better is not going to make sure to highlight every one of his strong points and analyze his weak points when he's on stage so that when he goes on stage, he makes sure you only see his best. And when you go on stage, you have the attitude that you're the winner right from the start. And that's, I think that's important, you know, to, to have that. And, you know, people, you know, say bodybuilding is all genetics. I, I do believe it is a lot, but you have to have the combination of genetics and also the mental proudness to go into, mm-hmm. you know, a show and and be a winner and be a champion. Which is also genetic. So I, I, I do believe that that's a genetic mm-hmm. trait to, uh, you know, to be with a winning attitude, to have that winning attitude constantly, you know, and even with challenges, you know, getting rid of the white noise. You know, I tell people always, you know, block the white noise. There's always um, crap that's out there talking about what you can't do. You know, what can you do? You know, and that's exactly right. It's the white noise. It's the white noise. I call it the same thing. It's so prevalent. (laughs) It's so funny. Yeah. and, and, And that's the part that when you're totally focused and driven, you know, you got to do the work. You know, we're, we're, we had that, you know, we were on that um, Palumbo show and, you know, Chris Aceto goes, oh, Rich is like idiot Savani he kept saying, you got to work, you got to work, you know, but it, then you get the point. It's not just work. It's mental attitude. It's work. It's also not giving up. Right. You know, work is one part of it. You know, you can work really hard. You know, I, I used to say like my dad worked his ass off, but I would never do that work. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> digging ditches. You know, I'm not, I'm not picking up blocks and bricks. Cause my dad used to go, I could teach you hard work. I said, I definitely, you know, you know, know that you work hard, but it's not the work I want to do. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, you know, it's fun. I, I mean, I, I took another road. I unfortunately followed that path and, and learned construction. Yeah. And it's very defeat. So it's very defeating, but I, I have, it's an interesting comparison I remember building a block wall one time and I was doing, it was, I was doing it myself. I had no help. I was mixing mortar myself, laying block, you know, and it was this process. It was only about a four foot high wall and, and I'm working down and I'm, it was, it was hot and I'm working my ass off. It's about three, four hours into the day. And I just go like fucking soaking wet and I'm tired to get a drink. And, and I look at how much I did and I looked at how much I had left to go, and I'm going, "Oh my God, this is going to take forever. I'm going to die." But then you look, you go to the gym, you know, and you start, you know, the guy just shows up. It's your second week ever training, and you start doing squats with 135 on the bar, if that, okay. And, and you look at you, 735, you know, or you know, five plates for reps, six plates for reps. I mean, it, it, it's enough to make you want to go home and never go back to the gym. But where does where does that you know, having done construction, bodybuilding's way harder. It's way harder, way harder. And I can only imagine on your level, and, and your contemporaries how insanely hard it must have been. But you weren't the only one. Who else impressed you about a, a work ethic? Who, was there any, or I should say, was there anybody else who impressed you with their work ethic that worked hard that really grounded out like i mean I, I i've been to the gym and you know back in my era you know tom platz was a very hard train i've watched him train you know because i heard about his training I, I guess you've seen him train and he definitely trained really really hard crazy differently from what i did he would do these half reps and quarter reps. he would do a rep until he couldn't do the rep yeah you know i would do i and, and i on the other hand would do drop sets like when mm-hmm. i couldn't do a full rep I would drop the weight and keep going and going and going and going until I was exhausted to exhaust that muscle. So I saw his technique and I go, wow, that's really hard training. You know, today's bodybuilders, you know, I was impressed with Dorian Yates. Um, I trained with um, Branch Warren, who trained really hard. Um, you know, there's a couple of guys that I've seen, but then there's a lot of guys that just, 
fortunately, they have great genetics. I mean, you have Lee Haney. At, you know, I trained with Lee Haney, and, and everything him was him was very, you know, just precise. You know, doing a lift was just very precise and squeezing that muscle. But it was never to failure. It was kind of just working that muscle. And he, you know, he always said like, "What did he say?" He said, um, "Emulate, don't annihilate." Emulate, don't annihilate. <laughs> and 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 I see, but. But it didn't work for me just stimulating. He had to go more because my body didn't have his genetics. Right. But I, I mean, he did teach me proper form in training. And I can't down someone that doesn't have to push himself as hard as I had to because I'm living it now with issues with my neck. If you saw my last post, I showed that I'm doing, um, you know, uh, what's it called? Cryo, okay, cryotherapy? You're I'm doing, doing the cryotherapy. But also and the, the pain. stem cells. No, I did st- I did stem cells too. I'm doing stuff. I'm doing a lot of things right now for my neck. I'm doing. St- I just talked to my doctor too. It's like, you know, I have, you know, you know, yet you looked at an MRI in my neck, and and through anybody training for long, long periods, your neck takes a lot of stress, and so what happens is those yep. discs just get degenerative, and I got to the point that my right side just that's that's what retired me. I hurt any of the disc, mm-hmm. and. I just been now going to do um, this stem cell, you know, they put you out and they actually inject um, the cells of the umbilical cords of babies and they purify it. And that stem cell mimics whatever cell is needed to be repaired. So if the sheath of your nerve is damaged, it'll repair that. So I've had it done in the last couple of weeks and I'm actually feeling so much better. And then what I've had done was acupuncture where they're sticking needles from my neck and down into my tricep and then putting electric mm-hmm. impulses to try to get that nerve to come back to life. And I'm actually seeing the muscle, you know, come back. Wow. It's going to take time. But then, you know, he said you have some what's called outer stenosis, which is actually bones that start to spur and they're hitting the nerve. So now I got to go see a doctor to see about cutting those, pieces of bones and, and there's probably audience saying like just stop training <laughs> i don't want to stop training and i'm I, and i believe that i can get myself back where i can train and continue to train for another 20 years by fixing this issue that anybody who trains for long periods john if you look at your neck and back they're probably oh my know, neck is, my neck is shot man i'm getting i'm getting uh um feels like a spider web of numbness that climbs up here yeah, now. Yeah, that's, that's... goes to sleep all the time. The, I, this arm goes to sleep. I have a lot of, you know, I can feel it, man. I have a definite. And, you well, know, I that's what I was somebody. getting. I, you know, I, I know that if you don't take care of this issue, it gets worse and worse where it yep. gets to the point that, you know, my right arm would start to just get more and, you know, atrophy more and more. Right now I have weakness, but what I didn't want was my arm. My dad had a horrible issues with his neck and he had surgery and they botched the surgery and his whole right side basically was paralyzed and it just turned into like bone. So, you know, the doctor's telling me what I'm doing now is helping me for the next 20 years by taking care of it. So, I mean, that's why I'm doing it. And then people like, just stop training. Why do I got to stop training? I don't want to stop training. I love training. I love, you know, going to the gym. I still love pushing myself. Do I train as heavy as I used to? not like I used to, but I still train harder than probably 90% of the people, you know, in my, in my late fifties, you know? Well, you, you know, that's, that's interesting. Cause I, I have that. I mean, I, I have, a, I've had to change my way of training to, you know, go around all my injuries, but I, my training is pretty much all circuit training now. And I, I, you can really push in a circuit, but it's not like training heavy and you know, your physique changes, but I think at 60 years old, you know, I'm still cranking out, uh, you know, some pretty tough sets. And every now and then a young guy will jump in with me who's just a heavy lifter. And I, I always gas them. I mean, they're always toast by the by the second or third round because just like I, training that way. I do the know? same thing. I'll, I'll pre-exhaust the muscle for a guy who's stronger than me now so that he can't even lift the weight that, you know, <laughs> that normally would be nothing for the guy. Now he can't right. lift it. And I'm, I'm doing that weight because I'm used to training like that. So, yeah, I know what you're saying about yeah. doing that, you know. That's called a rope-a-dope, you know, like. <laughs> yeah. yeah, or gaslighting. But yeah. but so so the guys that trained, you know, super hard back in the day, you know, you, 
Um, uh, I know um, Bronnie Coleman, especially, is having a terrible time, uh, you know, with nerve issues and, you know, disc problems and muscle issues and everything. Quite several others have had, you know, these issues. What, what do you think of that? I mean, is that... I mean, is, is that really something that, you know, all of these guys today who are, are going to look forward to or is or have we learned anything from from guys like you who have, you know, pushed it a little too hard? I mean, I pushed really hard. And then I see what Ronnie did is I think Ronnie pushed. See, I was younger, so I pushed in my early 20s. Mm-hmm. Me and Ronnie are the same age, yet he pushed 12 years later, later into his 30s and 40s which I think attributed to why he's in the condition he's in. By the time I was 33, I was retired from bodybuilding already. You know, I came back a couple of times and I, I, I basically at 35, I was basically, you know, done. He started at 35 and then went on, you know, from this mid thirties, early thirties into his forties, you know, as Mr. Olympia. And I think when you're older, you don't heal as quicker. And he's had all these, issues that affected him. I think also after he's had surgeries, he kept training heavy when he should have backed away. You know, he had hip surgery and just kept training and it, it affected him. And I mean, he is where he is today. I mean, he was an amazing bodybuilder and I've never seen, I still think he's one of the best. If competing today, I don't think, I don't think guys could beat him. Uh, no, today. Not in his and, best. Uh, I don't think so. And he's, you know, he's an amazing bodybuilder, but he's paying for it now on how he is. I, I feel pretty good because I'm still training. I'm as as old as Ronnie, but I, I'm not on painkillers and I have no pain. I am more careful. I'm not sitting there squatting when, you know, I know if I put a bar, squat bar on my back, I can probably still squat 405 because I've tried it <laughs> like an idiot. <laughs> but, but, you know, and I'll do some reps with it and I'll put it down and, but then I'm fucked. I'm going to be like, <laughs> I, I know my back is just going to hurt. My neck's going to hurt. And I'm like, I just stay away from those exercises. I mean, I'll do a lot of leg presses. A really good squat is a, is a belt squat. Have you done a belt squat? I have. Really, really good because it actually pulls on your mm-hmm. spine. Right. So you're, you're holding that and you're squatting down, but you're not feeling that pressure that a squat would do on your back and your neck. It's, it's kind of almost like getting traction at the same time. As exactly, because while it's pulling you down, yeah. you're squatting, and it's not causing any type of stress. So you could go really heavy on that and really feel your legs, you know, doing that movement. Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, I still like training hard, but I still I want to train smart. You know, I'm doing what I'm doing now to to be preventative. You know, the doctor said I want to see you do this for another 20 years. You know, if you can, but he goes if you keep training the way you're training. And you don't fix the issue you have it's in five, six years, you're going to have to have major surgery. And I don't want to have that major surgery, have my neck fused. You know, right now I don't have to have my neck fused. Um, a lot of, you know, issues that people have from lifting weights that I definitely want to stay away from, you know, as long as I can. Right. Well, De- Dexter made a great, um, you, you know, comment on on our show when he talked about his longevity is based on the fact that he never really put that many miles on the clock because he didn't do any cardio. So there was, so there was none of that. And he, the, you know, wear and tear on his joints from doing hours and hours and hours of cardio every week. And he only trained for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes a day. So he, he, there's a genetic freak, you know, we had him on the show and, and you know, he, he said like, oh, when I turned like my 40s, my mid 40s, I had to diet, I had to start dieting because the guy was eating like hamburgers and competing, you know, McDonald's hamburgers or he would eat plain food when he's on a trip to mm-hmm. Europe and still win shows because he was just genetically gifted. And, you know, I've seen him train where he had like 35 pound dumbbells and curls and, and it, like, and his arms just were massive, you know, know. curling, you know, like it was heavy, yeah. you know, where I'm doing, like trying to do eighties, you know, in my, <laughs> my, my peak form, you know what I mean? Like it was, it's just, that's just certain people have great genetics and what, you know, he, he competed till he was, what is it? 51. Yeah. And he has no, in, you know, I, I, well, we talked to him. He doesn't really have any injuries. Nope. And He's retiring, you know, in good shape. In good shape. 
he, you he, know, Beckles, I knew him, you know, we, they always compare, you know, Dexter to Beckles. Yeah. Beckles kept training. His last show, believe it or not, he was 62 and he wow. won. He won the Niagara Pro at 62. That's, I, I didn't even know that's amazing. When I was against him, he was 55. He beat wow. me, came in coming in second place, and I was barely 21. But um, him today, Beckles, his neck and his back are totally fused. Yeah. They're all, he's all. Yeah, fused. I mean, we, we, we got a lot of those stories. Dexter's like the Carlo Gambino of bodybuilding. He's, he's you know, Carlo Gambino just skated through the mob. You know, he never got arrested, never got killed, never got, he just, Lived, did the mob life and kept died going. Old age. He died of old, old, old age, right? Peacefully. So, and, <laughs> and it's like Dexter. Dexter's no injuries. He won almost. He won twenty nine shows, even though he's including the Olympia, and he, and and he's and he's skating through the the rest of it. I feel bad for these guys who pushed it so hard and are paying for it now. You know, they're guys like you are having a you know Ronnie Al Beckles. These guys are having some you know serious issues. You know, going back, if you could, if you could go back and do it over again, would would you do it differently? I think I would have been a little bit. Now that I have the knowledge, you know, and training that I have now, I would have definitely been a lot more careful, you know, to prevent the injuries. I don't think I needed to push as hard as I did. You know, kind of what Lee Haney said. You know, stimulate, don't annihilate. I still wanted to push a muscle. But I think a lot of times I overtrained a muscle that I that I probably could have avoided. Um, I used to do like heavy behind the neck presses, you know, with 365 for reps. I think that wasn't too good for my neck. You know, when I'm doing that, you know, or squat, even squatting that super heavy weight was all, you know, it was all ego to do it. I was a bodybuilder, yet I wanted to show how strong I was, you know, in the gym. And I, you know, I tore my pec. I was doing... 405 on Smith machine inclines, you know, I was getting ready for the Arnold and I, you know, I, I had a, a pec tear because I was doing, you know, I normally do dumbbells and I went to a, a Smith machine, which is different because you're more in one position when you're doing that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what caused me to get that tear because dumbbells, you could kind of yeah, adjust were stuck. them. And because I was stuck in that one position, I did, I remember it like yesterday I was doing 135 for like, 15, 20 reps. I did 225 for 15 reps. Then I did 315 for 15 reps. And then I went to 405 and I still did. I did nine reps. And on the 10th rep on my way down, I felt like a short tear. It went, ah. get it off, get it off. And then that was it. I tore, you know, I tore my pec. Did you get and it? I could have avoided that. I didn't need to. That was, that was um, four weeks out from the show. I was shredded already. And I trained that heavy. And I don't think it was necessary to go that heavy into that show. What, what was that movie you you were in a long time ago? Road Road to Gold or Road to the Road to something or uh, the Road? What was it called? The, the was it Road to the Olympia or, or was it Go for the Gold? Go, go for, for the, the gold. gold. Yeah, that was that was the '88. I mean, I was living in California. You know, that's when you know Lee. That's the, one of the Olympias that I think I was at. You know, my one of my best. Um, well, and, Lee, you know, Lee said, well, the reason I brought it up, Lee, they were interviewing Lee and they were talking about you. And, and Lee said, yeah, Richie, Richie's too intense. <laughs> it's yeah. like you, were, you were meaning that you, you were too much for yourself, yeah. for your own good, basically. Well, I, I went into a show with the attitude. I don't know if people realize that you could hear old interviews. I went into a show and I trained in the gym. And I trained so hard that I said, I had an attitude, which was like a warped attitude. I said, I'm going to get to the gym. I'm going to train. I'm going to push myself to, to the ultimate. And if I don't push myself to that ultimate, uh, there's somebody who's going to kill my entire family <laughs> in front of me. <laughs> that's what, and that was in my head. Wow. <laughs> that was, that's what I put in my head. I go, okay, if I don't do this workout and I don't need X amount of reps and I don't do this, you know, I remember popping blood vessels in my eyes doing legs Jeez. and i said if i don't do this they're gonna kill my they're gonna slit my family's throat in front of me so i have to do this workout so now did haney have trouble like corralling you or 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 did it how, how did that how did that you know relationship work well he he, he honed he honed in that 
he needed that energy because that energy helped him win the Olympia. Right. You know, he can admit that that was his best training, you know, with me. And he wanted me to train with him his last Olympia too, because that was his last show and he wanted to, you know, come out and he, you know, he still won and he looked the best, but that Olympia, I pushed him. And, and although he was the pro and I was the amateur, I always pushed him to say, that all you can do? That all you can do? <laughs> and that would get him so mad. You know, to push him. So, so well, what, I got to hear, what was a typical, what was a typical training session with Lee like? I mean, w- when you showed up, was he there before you? Was you there, were you there before him? Who was I, I usually was there before to go him. Or- yeah, he, he was the star, so I was there before him. We'd always start with calves. We did calves three to four times a week. We did it before all our body parts in the morning. And we would do, you know, five sets of five or six sets of donkey calf raises with, you know, weights attached to us with him on my back. You know, <laughs> back then, I don't know if people know about donkey calf raises because people look at that and they're like, what do you do? You get on someone's back? I go, yeah, you get on back and then you use a, a dip belt, you know, with 200 pounds attached to you doing, you know, doing uh, calf raises. And we would do those calf raises um, you know, five to six sets, 15 to 20 reps, drop set, drop set, drop set, then go to seated calves, do five to six sets, drop set, drop set, drop set, you know, and that, and that was the beginning when we started a workout, whether it was chest or back. He was pushing, I was pushing his legs. He was pushing my upper body because I needed to, my legs, I needed to hone down. He needed to get his legs, you know, up to par, you know, for, for his body. And, you know, that year, I just remember put. I was very strong in legs, so I could push him harder on leg press. And certain things he showed me also. I don't know when I do a leg press or a hack. You know, you lift your toes off the the platform, right? And it really stresses your legs. And we would be doing leg press like that, and then superset it with hack squats. You know, we anything he would say, hey, let's do this. I'd be like, okay, let's do it, and, that, <laughs> and then I would push him. So and, and, and he would charge you with throwing everybody off the bench that was off. Yeah, the, he basically the blamed me. He he basically was, you know, he, Lee Haney was the gentleman, you know. So, you know, he was the pro and the gentleman. But I was like the pit bull saying, "Okay, Rich, we got to use that bench. Ask him how many sets and get him <laughs> off. We got to use that bench. Get off the bench." <laughs> it's like. <laughs> now you, you were you guys were training in Reseda, which is the Valley Gym. Go yeah. On. Okay, and then the other goals, of course, is in Venice. And there was we actually went to World's Gym and Gold's Gym. We went more to World's Gym. We would go to on the weekends. We would go to World's Gym. Lot, uh, did you guys come to train legs? A lot of guys would come to World to train legs. Cause exactly, we so we go there to do legs. A lot of times back. He had some really good back. Yeah, old school back equipment there. You remember the stuff that he well, had? He, yeah, Joe. I was his neighbor. Joe built all of that. The Joe Gold. Just amazing, like low cable rows and. Just great, great stuff in that gym. You know, and you'd go up those stairs, you know, just remember going up those stairs in that one floor, and there was so much energy in that gym. It was, and then you'd see like Arnold in one corner, you know, you'd see Samir in the other, you know, you'd see Platts, Platts, yep. Lou Ferrigno, Ferrigno. You would see all these guys in there, and then you had. You know, had Joe, you know, the crotchety Joe was a great guy. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, but, it was, like, but it was a 1,500 square foot room, if that, right? It was not a it big. It was a small room. And then you had that outside, outside yeah. terrace that we would train. And that's where we take a lot of pictures yeah. on that terrace. It was just such a great memory, um, you know, to be, to living in that era, to be from- in that. It, it was, it was unbelievable. I know you, you were there at that time, but. I didn't see the original. I think you've seen the original Golds, correct? Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't train at the original. The, I, I got there when, um, I guess, Ken Sprague has, had bought it from Joe Gold when it was on Pacific, and he opened it up on 2nd uh, Avenue, Second Street in Santa Monica. That's where I joined. I mean, that's where I first saw Rodney. Uh, not, not the one that was in Venice, the little one that was... Pacific, no. That, they, actually, they actually uncovered it. It had gotten sold and and turned into a house and when the current owner was remodeling it they had peeled off the facade and they saw the old gold's gym you know wall perfectly intact the whole right and they 
they preserved it. They left, so it's still there now. You can actually see the original. Oh, it's a guy's house, but it has gold shit. Yeah, it's, it's his house now, but he's he preserved the wall. You know, the, oh, it's expanded, of course, and changed. Talking it. about Gold's Gym, you know that Paul Grimkowski just passed away. Oh, Paul did really? Yeah, Paul Grimkowski. Oh wow! I, I think he was. I'm not sure how old he was, but um, I think he started with Pete Grimkowski, correct? Him and well, his brother. Well, he. Well, I met him. When I bought my the Gold's Gym license for Puerto Vallarta, I bought it from him. So he was he was the license he was the licensing um, person at, at Gold's. So I you know yeah I had a he was a really really nice guy Pete's Pete's brother Paul yeah yeah really, so really, really just, nice guy. A lot of these guys are passing away. You know the the guy who did the whole Rick Drayson who did the logo. Did you know Rick Rick Drayson? I did. Yep. Yeah. Another yep. guy who was on, was on his logo. show, he also passed away. A lot of them are going. A lot of them are <laughs> leaving us, you yeah. know? And, and the young ones too, man. Andy Hammond just died, you know, at 55 yeah, years old. that's and, very sad. And I, I heard him, he, he had surgery on his elbow. And um, did you hear something yes. happened with, with, I guess it. What, what happened? Like what? what it, yes. What his brother said was that a, a, Blood clot broke off that surgical site where he had his elbow on it when it was when it was it was a pulmonary embolism. It went to his lungs and he, he the, his brother said he was with one or two other guys. They were hanging out in the room. They left to go do something. Came back ten minutes later and Andy was on the floor. That's how fast it happened. Wow! So that's just a freak accident. Just one of those complete freak things. Yeah. From an elbow surgery, yep. which you would never think would do. You would never ever think. Wow! Yeah. And he was a great guy. If you knew, if you knew Andy, and if you've been to any of the shows, nicest guy in the world. Yep. Really, really, he always like made comments. You know, even after like on my social media, I'd always say things. And uh, I, I knew he was a really strong guy too, like super strong, yes. very strong, stupid strong. You know, yeah. And yeah, then, uh, another impressive. guy, I, I, I there's, there's one incident. We were at a trade show. I think it was the Europa and we went to, uh, we went, you know, we'd go out to nightclub afterwards, you know, a lot of times and, you know, he drank a little bit, Andy. And I think there was like five bouncers couldn't hold him down. <laughs> That's how strong he was. <laughs> he was just throwing people off of you know, stuff. <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> you know, it's 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 a couple of guys in in the industry are like that. Jimmy the Bull, Pelletia, you, you know who he is, right? Yes. Jimmy the Bull. He well, he used to be a bouncer, and he he used to work a door in a club in Long Island with Mike with Mike uh, with um, Jimmy Quinn. Yeah. And Jimmy Jimmy likes to drink a beer uh, or two or three or four every now and then, you know. So on his night off, he would go to that club because he could drink for free and jimmy quinn said man after the third beer you had to start following him around <laughs> what are you gonna do with jimmy the bull he can bench press a thousand pounds how many bouncers are you gonna need to pull him off you know Jeez, some, that's funny you guys a few guys in our our, our history have been notorious <laughs> guys and, and and when it comes to bar fights and shit like that that's never you though right no I, I wasn't a fighter i i was always a happy guy never never gotten fights in bars and stuff that wasn't my thing <laughs> even though i was a bouncer when i was in my 20s you know and i was like you know that was another thing the guy he goes this guy you know he's talking about me i was 19 years old i was i was like 258 i mean i wasn't i was solid i wasn't ripped but i was still big and you know i worked as a bouncer and i was like almost 260 in this nightclub in Jersey. And, and I, I got in one incident where it, I remember, you know, I didn't really fight. I just grabbed the guy and just the guy couldn't move. And, I just, like, threw him out. <laughs> <laughs> and the owner goes, you did that so fast, you know, like, wait, how, how, get tall, a fight? <laughs> <laughs> how tall are you? Five, nine, five, ten, I'm like five, eight and a half. Five, yeah. Uh, 260. 260. Okay. I was 260, 260 at five, eight and a half. That's a freaking monster. And you just grab you just grab the guy. I, well, I remember I was telling you, I was squatting 730, benching 520, <laughs> behind your neck pressing 360. Yeah. So when I grabbed the guy, he, he didn't have a shit. He couldn't do anything. He was just like, <laughs> so I just pick him up 
And the guy's like, just like, you know, like a baby. <laughs> <That's just> like, <laughs> I threw him out into the street. And the, and the owner's like, damn, you just threw that guy like a rag doll. <laughs> what you did? <laughs> So oh, it's, that, that was my, amazing. that was my, you know, when I, I bounced would be right before I moved to California. I was, that was what I was doing is bouncing there I was bouncing at strip clubs. <laughs> that's all I did. Well, that, yeah. And that, that's how you meet all the right girls, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's another thing. That, yeah. You, you don't want to meet those girls. <laughs> Isn't it funny though, how bodybuilders and strippers kind of just kind of naturally go together. Attract it has other. something to do with like the bodies staying on the bodies. I, I went through a stripper period there for a while where it was exclusively <laughs> they, they were a lot of fun, you know, as long as you didn't get serious with them. Yeah, you, know? you could get serious with them. You could, you, could, you could put a lot of stock in them, but they they were always up for a good time. They, they had a great ad, you know, they were happy, generally happy girls, you know, I had a great time. Until you but, got to know them personally, then you're yeah, But unlike sure. you, I didn't marry them. So I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I learned. I learned. It took me a long time, but I learned. Well, at least, at least you learned. Yeah. So, so who, who today, today's bodybuilders have gotten this, this, I, I want, I want to ask you if you think it's deserved. They've got kind of a bad rap. They don't train as hard. They take way more juice than everybody. They got a bad work ethic, their attitude. What do you, and is that a, do you kind of, do you consider that a blanket statement for the majority of the modern day bodybuilder, or, or or you think it's just a couple of bad apples, or spoiling the whole bunch, or do you think there is an absolute definite line between then and now, and it's defined by what? I mean, I I can't say a, a general blanket statement. Hey, wait a second, there's a lot of noise. Right? Do you hear the noise? Yeah, it's a dog. It's okay. Hold on, right now. <laughs> Who's down there? I'm in the middle of a, of a podcast. Yeah, let me. Sorry, I'm gonna have to edit this. No worries. I may leave it in. <laughs> <laughs> anyways, anyways, let's get back. Um, so you're talking about a blanket statement about today's bodybuilders. I mean. I know there are some young guys that's, that train really hard. There's some women that train. I mean, one of our athletes, there's a girl that is one of our athletes and really trains hard, you know, and, and not just for a girl. She trains hard for a guy girl. And, 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 it, and she'll go through any kind of workout. And, you know, I train with her. You know, she's an athlete. She says, I want to train with you. I, I train with her. And, damn, she'll do anything that I do and push it. And do more and want, and want to pain. And then there's guys that I've I've trained with that are, you know, good bodybuilders that are competing in, you know, some of the shows, you know, they're pros actually. I'd be pros. And and in, in my fifties, I can kill these guys in their twenties. And I just don't get it. You know, so there are some guys that train hard and and I'm seeing more when especially because I'm in social media and I see some of these guys that train really, really hard. But then there's a lot of guys that, you know, fortunately, you know, now that there's more people in bodybuilding, there's more Dexter Jacksons that are coming about that yeah. have those, you know, that have the great genetics and they lift weights a little bit. And these guys look phenomenal. Yeah. And, and if you push them, they go like, I don't train like that. That's too hard. You know, that, that, that's what they'll say. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I kind of look at it as a, as a dying art. I, I always thought the ability to psychologically get yourself to push and do more than you could normally do is, is part of the game. It's part of the exercise. It's one of the exercises. Part of building your body is, is, is pushing your brain to push your body, you know? So um, I, I kind of miss that element. I, I noticed it in the gym today. There, there's guys who train, but I think it's just, they just don't know or can't conceptualize the the what that real intensity is like because so few people today put it out there you know um you know I, I was fortunate to be able to see guys like you and the training partners I had and you know exemplify what intensity is I trained with Mike Menser I mean you know he, Mike Menser put me through a, a bicep workout one time that I probably still think about as being 
um, you know, more anxiety causing than going to the dentist. I mean, that was an insane. I, I never experienced anything like that before, and I don't think anybody today could fathom it. It was just ridiculous. So, right. um, See, I'd love to have worked out with him. I mean, I I I came out to California. I mean, we trained obviously differently because mm-hmm. he was all about, I guess, reps to failure. Well, he was. Sets. He was the one one set. He he believed that one set to absolute momentary failure, whereas the the brain says contract and the muscle says no. Um, if, if he thought that that was anything beyond that was counterproductive, so okay. um, and, and and it gave you more time to recover, which is recovery, which is where you grew the muscle. Look, who's going to argue with the guy? First first and only perfect score in the Mister Universe. Um, you know, the, the guy was an amazing bodybuilder and yeah. Dorian Yates, another phenomenal bodybuilder of our time, got his, you know, learned his, and you know, it's funny, watching him. you know, Dorian had a lot of injuries, you know, training that method, but Mike, I guess maybe because retired so early, he had no, not that I know of any injuries. Well, see, I, and, may, and maybe that's maybe, and we can ask Dorian this, if he comes on the show, I think that was. The, the delineation because Mike did one set. That's it. And and whereas Dorian didn't, he, he definitely went to failure, but he went more than one set. So there was more work on Dorian's side, possibly taxing his body more. I don't know if you could say that, you know, Menser quit too soon or the Dorian overdid it, but there's got to be an overlap there somewhere, which is whereas maybe Mike didn't do enough and Dorian did too much. And there's the happy balance is somewhere in the middle. But, um, I, you know, I took a lot away from Mike. I, I worked with him at muscular development for a long time. So I, I got to know him really well. And, you know, the, the training that, that I got from him was really I, I mean, it, out of all of it, I mean, I remember the most the, the most intense workouts I can remember were when I trained with Dean Tornabeni. The, you know who that is? Yeah, little, yeah. And the little big guy, and um, and Menser. And other than that, it's all a blur. But the, every those guys stand out because of the sin, insane intensity they were able to generate. And I believe that is a concept that is very difficult to share unless you actually hands-on put somebody through it. Um, and although, um, you know, you can come close, but I don't think it's explainable. Do you think it is? No, I, I think you, you you have to really experience intensity to understand what it is. And people think they understand intensity. And I still can give a glimpse of what I've done. But I say, you wouldn't be able to handle me when I was in my 20s. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm doing now that you think is so hard, is nothing compared to what I did, you know, like in my twenties. Right. You know, so no, I, I don't think they understand that, that training, that intensity to balls to the wall failure and getting a muscle to just not be able to go any further. It, it's, and it's to me, it was a euphoric feeling to get to that point. Mm-hmm. Cause oh, I remember yeah, training yeah. and it was almost like you were in like in a, you were like in a tunnel. Right. And nothing, I didn't see anything. Everything was a blur around me when I got into that zone. And, and you can get there with a 25-pound dumbbell. I you mean, can. You, you can. I mean, really, you can. Just keep, just don't stop. I mean, that's that's what it comes down just to. Train, you train a muscle till it can't be pushed oh, it anymore. it can't move anymore. Which is, which is a great segue to the next thing I want to talk about, which is your book. Uh, definitely, on. guys. If you, want to, if you want to be able to get, uh, you know, a piece of you know, understanding of what I did, you know, the Classic Physique Bible is a comprehensive book on my off-season, pre-contest, uh, dieting, contest dieting, posing, supplementation. You know, it, it's the works in, in me explaining, you know, what I did. And like, you know, you said you, um, you know, edited the book and, uh, you know, was able to relay my philosophies, you know, out there to the, to the public to understand it. Um, it goes into about intensity. Uh, so if you want the book, um, it's a great book. It's $19.99. Um, you know, it's got videos on the training, you know, how to train properly as well. Embedded videos. Uh, go to dragonslayermedia.com and you can get, you know, 
pieces of the book or you get the entire book. The best deal is getting the entire book for the 1999.